It's good to be back with you. I uh, hope you had a good Holy Week. And uh, we're going to do one more week together on Peter. We had stopped, I think, in John 6, just kind of walking through each gospel and seeing what we see, not just about Peter, but more importantly, what do we see about the Lord in his life, his interactions with Jesus? And what else does he tell us about our own discipleship, about how we're to take on those common traits uh, that we've talked about? So we'll finish up with Peter uh, today, and then next week, we'll try to finish up just a general view of, of discipleship and the 12 disciples, and probably talk a little bit about Paul. Uh, just to finish that up. So I hope you'll be there and next week, and then we'll be done. We will restart Pastor's Bible Study in the middle of August. So I hope this has been a blessed series for you. Again, please email me, Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, at madisonumc.org, or call the church office if we can ever meet to talk about what's stirring within you, what you're learning through this series. Well, let's turn to John 3, uh, 13, verse 6, and let's just walk, walk through a few passages in John and see what we can see here about Peter. You remember John 13 well. Jesus has washed the feet, and you've heard preachers preach about it. You've been in Sunday schools where you've, you've been taught about it, so we'll do this all very quickly. But it's a, it, it is, a, it is a, again, a sad contrast to John 6. We, we ended with this, I think, encouraging word to Jesus. Everybody, John 6, verse 66, everybody's leaving Jesus, and you get this, this, this word to Jesus from Peter. Where else we, who else are we going to go to? Who else has the words of eternal life? But now there's a, a sharp contrast to that. You're never going to wash my feet. Now, now some and very few think maybe this is a pride issue, a show issue in front of other disciples. You know, I'm a leader. I don't need this. Eh, it doesn't read that way. You know, I want to protect your character. That's too low for you. You're holy. You're God. Don't do, you know, you're, you're Messiah. You don't do that for me. Maybe there's some of that. Maybe there's just some humility, um, even care for Jesus. It was my understanding that in that day, Jewish slaves could not be forced to do this act because it was considered unclean to wash feet. So maybe that's what's going on. But you would think by now, at least, even though Peter's right to always ask questions, this, this kind of conversation, you shouldn't correct Jesus. We've had that problem at Caesarea Philippi and here as well. Um, and, but this is getting routine. But what also is getting routine is not only does Peter mess up, but, but I, I wonder if Jesus, just like we're going to see in Acts, is using Peter to help everybody see, the, see this. You're a leader. And so I'm going to use you so everybody can, can, can know what, who I am. Uh, there may be something to that. But anyway, you know that passage well. We don't need to spend time in that. Uh, you've studied that. And then we go to John 18. And, and this is a passage we, we probably don't talk a whole lot about. We just get fascinated. Who would pull a sword on a mob? You know, so again, um, to have and 1810 is, is, is when he pulls a sword and, and cuts off Malchus's ear. Um, it's yet another time where there may have been good intentions, where he's trying to stick up for Jesus. At least he pulls a sword, because we know by Scripture he's not the only one with the sword. Right? We have two swords here. He at least pulled it. He at least got out of the boat. He at least, you know, he's trying to be a friend. Uh, so maybe the intention is good, where he's trying to stand in the gap for Jesus. And again, in our culture, what a what a great ministry you and I can have. It needs to be appropriate. This is not appropriate, uh, but to stand in the gap for others in such a busy and hurried schedule. But we're going to take the time in our prayer life. We're going to take the time um, to, to stand in the gap for our friends or for our family. It's a, it's a great ministry we, we can't meet, uh, miss. But here's another uh, example of when Jesus, Jesus says to Peter, you're an adversary. Just like he called him Satan, the, the root word there being that you're adversarial. You are like the devil to me at Caesarea Philippi. I'm, I'm here to die, and you're pulling me aside and rebuking me. Well, it's the same thing here yet again. You, you're still missing it. We're right at the edge of of, of, of Holy Week, right here at the cross, where, where he's come to, to be Lamb of God for them. 
and and you've got you've got Peter missing it again. Jesus says in the next verse, verse eleven, "Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it?" So here you are opposing yet again for the very reason why I have come. So it's it's a um, it's it's a good word for us, a challenging, confronting word. We should never be in the way of the kingdom. Where am I life if I'm saying my will over, over your will? This is what I want over what. Here's what the kingdom needs out of my life right now. And, and finally, Peter's going to get it. You get to Acts 5.29, and he says, we've got to obey God more than we obey man. So if you remember, I understand why he wants Jesus to stay. I understand why he wants Israel to be free and just for Jesus to establish his kingdom there. All those wants that he has, no, all I want is what Jesus prayed in the garden. I'm going to obey God, not my desires. I'm not going to obey man. I'm going to obey God rather than obey man. So finally, he gets it. But here, it's not just Caesarea Philippi. Um, there are other places where we see Peter being in opposition to what the kingdom has. I did hear a Baptist preacher once say um, that this is a last love letter of Jesus to his people, um, to, uh, excuse me, to, to the high priest, this, this one Malchus who serves him. It's a, it's a, the healing there. You come at me with a mob, you come at me with weapons. Um, I, I'm going to come at you with healing. Don't do this. It's, it's a last chance. It's a last reach. It's a last love letter to say, don't do this. Um, I think, I think, again, it's, we, we, we just kind of read over this. And we talk about Peter, but what an act of mercy um, and grace from Christ here right before he's taken by the mob. Let's keep going in John, John 21, uh, 3, verse, chapter 21, verse 3. And it's just simply Peter saying again, hey, I'm going fishing. And this is a preacher stretch here. I'm probably making too much out of this passage. But I want you to see the sphere of influence Peter has. He says, I'm going fishing, and everybody who's there, not all of them, but the disciples who are there, follow. There's something right that Jesus has seen in him. You are, to, you are a leader. You are bold, and you make things happen. And uh, they follow. So he's an influencer. He's a leader. Um, and so it's a reminder to us, disciples make disciples, that I am to, to lead change. I am to influence, whether it's family, whether it's friends, it's church, it's co-workers, it's neighbors. What has God gifted to you to be used for his kingdom work? He, he, he found Peter and refined him as a leader. I, th I think that's there. And you're going to see it later in Acts 2. We've said he's redeemed his mouth. <laughs> he's constantly adversarial. He's, he's speaking out of turn. And all of a sudden now you've got this controlled mouth, this mouth that's bold instead of saying, no, I, I don't know him three times. Now you've got him in Acts 2 and elsewhere being very loud about the kingdom, even getting out of jail and being loud about the kingdom. So disciples make disciples. We can't miss that common trait. They lead people. So what is it? What spiritual gifting? What talent? What witness do you have? How is it your model needs to lead people? This is a side issue I know. Hey, let's go fishing and people follow. But people follow leaders. How are you leading with your life, with your attitude, with your words, with your gifts, with your talents, with your witness? John 21, again, every preacher has taught this. and I'm not going to get into the different Greek words. Do you love me? You've had all that in Sunday school. But just again, the sweetness of this. Let's look to Christ. Just this beautiful moment of reconciliation. Peter's denied three times. And now you've got this restoration. And that's always the goal. He's given to us, Scripture says, a ministry of reconciliation. You see Jesus do that well. What he calls us to do, he has already done. He's modeled that for us. Three denials and these three affirmations. Um, and by the way, that's just a reminder too to us. That's always the goal. It's not just to get our kids obedient or to get work done. It's always relational. We can't miss that. The goal is to get people home to the Lord. The, the goal is, is unity uh, within the body. And so uh, I love that this is, there, there are moments of discipline. You find that in the Old and New Testament. I mean, sharp discipline in the book of Acts. But the goal is not to be punitive. The goal is always uh, to restore. The goal is always a reconciliation. I just need to be checked on that from time to time in my parenting, uh, in my work with 
coworkers and, and how I deal uh, with friendships. If I've been burnt or hurt. Um, I don't know. I think, I think, um, you know, we talked a couple, a, week, a couple of weeks ago about go tell the disciples, but tell Peter that I'm alive. Now, I wonder if a few people heard that said, ooh, Peter's going to get it. He denied three. They know the story by now, right? They know you tell. And again, I read that as a thing of grace and of leadership. Tell, tell Peter he's a leader, but also I know he's messed up. You tell him I'm alive. It's going to be okay. But uh, I wonder if other people heard that. Tell Peter, uh, the women, when they you know, recounted that, uh, you're going to get it. But what you, what you get here is not Peter getting it. What you get him, what you get is him being restored. It's a great model for restoration and reconciliation. That's always the goal. Now, Peter's still Peter, so there's going to be whining right here. There's going to be an issue right here. Uh, and sadly, I can be there too, and maybe you can be there too. Uh, you have this great moment of grace in your life, and then you turn around and you won't offer grace, right? Jesus preached about that. Given a, a little bit of forgiveness uh, with some money and then go out and demand an un, a, a remarkable amount of money from somebody else. Uh, here we understand, I'll lead you to chapter 21, uh, verse 18. When you were younger, you used to gird yourself. You'd walk wherever you wish, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Uh, so we, we, we assume there uh, that Jesus is talking about Peter's martyrdom. <clears throat> which I get the hurt and the struggle over that, hearing those words. He's been beautifully restored. He hears that word. And the first thing on his mind is, what about that guy? We've talked about that before, so I won't, I won't talk, uh, uh, do, do, uh, speak too much on that. But again, it's just how quick we can be offered grace. But the minute we have a, feel a little squeeze, we go and squeeze others. The minute we have a little discomfort, we're, we pass that off uh, to other people. He should have said whatever Whatever's my cup, I'll drink it. That's what's been modeled. That's what's been just talked about. I don't want to get in the way of the kingdom, but his first thing again is, what about that guy? What about John? We assume it's John. What's going to happen to him? And Jesus says, you just worry. Whatever I want for him, I want for him. You just, you just follow um, me. Um, uh, verse 22. All right. Well, I want to do a quick quick review of his ministry. So we're going to go over the book of Acts. We can go to his epistles as well. We've studied first and second Peter, so I'd encourage you to go back to those Bible studies. But again, we see we see God taking a weakness, him, Peter being rash, Peter being loud, Peter uh, uh, not understanding, all these things that have come out of his mouth. And now it's just like God to take where we were once we meet Christ, now to redeem it, to use that weakness and to allow him to be strong. Let the weak say, I am strong, right? And so that God can get the glory. But I'm just a broken vessel, and you can you can heal, and you can redeem, and now look at the strength in my life. And it, so it has to be from God. It's not something I can drum up on my own. So you know that from Acts chapter 2 and the Pentecost. It's going to be just like Peter to, to get up and speak, but you would think he's been so defeated that maybe he might just say, let somebody else do it. No, I've called you to be a leader. I've, I'm going to use your weakness, and I'm also going to spiritually gift you. And so uh, not only does he stand up and speak in front of crowds that he used to be very afraid of, he was hiding, even denying to a girl, right, a younger girl. And now you've got him standing up in front of everybody in a packed, packed Pentecost. It wouldn't have been as packed as Passover, but it been a lot of people in the Holy City for that festival. And he uses his boldness for God, and he uses his mouth for God. Even in go to chapter 4, verse 13, they talk about, oh, the boldness uh, that he had. So I, I just, that's a good word for us. You can go over to Acts 14, uh, Acts 4 again. and Because uh, I, wonder, I wonder, wonder what people are saying about your life. Uh, what, what part of your personality, what, what, what weakness do you have that you can say, you know what, the Lord's made me strong in that. I used to be sharp with people. Now I have the gentleness of the Holy Spirit, that fruit of the Spirit in my life. Uh, I used to just talk, you know, and be very, or I was very timid. And now because of the filling of the Holy Spirit, because of what Christ done in my life, I can now speak up when it's time to speak up. There, there really has to be, he doesn't just save us for, for glory. There's sanctification work that he, that he desires to do and needs to do and must do. 
So what's that weakness that he's going to turn into a strength? What's that weakness that God wouldn't have been able to get out of, get any glory out of, but now he, but now he can. Uh, so he redeems uh, Peter's cowardice, you know, from the trials. And now here he steps up. You get him in Acts 4, 19, saying, we choose God over whatever you say. So it's a great boldness and strength. And it's, listen, he's still going to struggle. You're going to have Paul talk to him in Galatians. And you've got it. You go to Galatians 2, 12, and we'll be there in a minute. He's scared of this faction. So he's going to have this issue with eating with Gentiles. He didn't have a problem with it, but now there's a problem. And that's the sad thing. It can happen in churches. A couple of voices gets a little loud. So you just kind of shrink back from what you ought to do or what you ought to say. And you let them control. It can happen at work. It can happen in the family. Here's somebody who stood up to the crowd. And now he's, you know, physical threats. And now you've got him. What's the phrase? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. He's worried about what people might say over physical threats. Um, that's the power of words and the power of bad influence and people. So anyway, just a word. Don't, don't let anybody keep you from what you ought to be about. So he's bold. He still struggles. He's still very human. That's what discipleship is. Lord, show me, Holy Spirit, show me where I'm not being who I ought to be. Help me repent of that. And to be be strong for you, you get to Galatians two, and he's he's he is having some issues uh, again. So we see his ministry. We see uh, it's you know what what Christ can do through his uh, brokenness and weakness. The, I'll, you could there's a lot of miraculous work. You can go to chapter three, one through eight, chapter nine, verse thirty four and forty. In chapter three, they were going to their prayers. By the way, they're doing that in Acts ten nine as well. I think that is what. That's the reason behind what he can do, what he does. Jesus is son of God, so he can do what he does. But I think it's interesting that Jesus models that before he picks the disciples, before he goes to the cross. He's up in prayer for hours. And so that's that's the secret sauce that we can't miss as believers. We said that last week at our Monday Thursday service. This is to be typical of a disciple. He was found sleeping at his prayers when Jesus needed him. Uh, now he's able to do these miraculous things in Acts 3 and elsewhere, and I think it's because he's a man, he's a man of prayer. And then in chapter 9, 34 and 40, I want to I want to read that to you just for some background. Most of these passages we're real familiar with, but 9, 34 and 40. And Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you, arise and make your bed. And immediately he arose, verse 40. But Peter sent them out and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha or Tabitha arise and she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter she sat up so you've got this incredible ministry of uh of, of resurrection right and then this other ministry of of healing for somebody who's been bedridden for for eight years but again the background it's prayer that funds that that allows for that in Acts 3 but here as well I think you see it's not a mimicking, but that's what we want to do. Whatever Jesus's life is, I want my life to be his life. It's not some occultic new age, show me the mantra, show me the magic, and I can get what I want. It's not that. But whatever Jesus speaks, that's what I want my life to be. I want to speak like Jesus and speak as Jesus. Whatever is his life, I want that for my life. Jesus said to him at the John John. Uh, the end of John's gospel, you follow me. Well, he's following it to a T. Jesus had said, you're going to do these kinds of miracles, and he does. Uh, Jesus had modeled prayer, and he prays. Even the very words, Tabitha, uh, uh, you know, arise, there's there's something about that uh, get up. You remember Talitha Kum, the, 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 the Aramaic there. Uh, uh, and I say Tabitha, it's Tabitha, however you want to pronounce it in the... Um, her name, Dorcas. Is, uh, that's maybe that's easier to just say Dorcas. That's how we, a lot of us interpret that. But get up. That's 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 what Jesus said. Again, there's nothing magic in those words. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. And we'll we'll talk about that. I think uh, you see that throughout. You go back to chapter three, verse six. I love that too. Here's what I have for Peter, who thought he had a lot. I don't have anything. I just have the name of Jesus. I don't have silver or gold. I just have the name of Jesus. And again, he's the, they're very clear. There's no other name by which men are saved, under which men are saved. And uh, if you've been reading through the prophets, there's so much about the name 
of God and to, to, to be lifted up and there's power in the name. All right. Last couple of things, just some reminders here, and we won't look at all these verses, but we see him living out in his ministry, the com- many of the common traits of disciples that we, we talked about. If you go to Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 10, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, you see it at Pentecost. Acts 4, 8, or even Acts 1, you see it. But Acts 4, 8, he's then filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, Acts 10, 19, it's the Spirit who speaks to him. Paul would say later in the book of Romans, who are the children of God, the sons of God, those who are led by the Spirit. So it's not just about function. It's not just about doing, but it's always about relationship. It's listening to the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being filled by the Spirit. So that's a common trait for disciples. You see it in his life. You also see him again, the importance of grouping. Discipleship is not to be done on on an island. You can get saved on a deserted island. You can't get sanctified on one. So whether it's visited by Paul, Galatians chapter 1, you see him with John in his ministry in in the book of Acts, the importance of of grouping, of doing life together. It's not just get Christian books, listen to podcasts. It's me and Jesus. You've You've missed all of Scripture. There are times we stand alone, you bet. But the typical response of a follower of God and, and the ways in which we're to be encouraged and shaped and yes, disciplined, because I don't discipline myself. I need others to see that in me. I'm blind, sadly. Again, if you're reading the prophets, the heart's so decept- de- deceiving that I need the voice of others and the help of, help of others. Sometimes I can miss it even when it's clear in the scripture. So we need groups. We need others. And there's accountability pattern too. Jesus has held him accountable. You see Peter being a part of accountability, tough accountability with with um, Ananias and Sapphira uh, in chapter five of Acts, but also they can receive it when you get to Galatians two that we talked about. Paul says, I opposed him to his face. Peter, the leader, Peter, the one who stood up at Pentecost. Yeah. And I I did it to Barnabas too. We, we, um, uh, one-on-one, I think that's biblical model that Jesus gives us as well, but we've got to be, prayerful and careful when we give instruction or, or, or discipline, but it's biblical. I think maybe we're withholding that from our kids or from friends or from small groups. I want to be real. I want anybody to check my life, but we've also got to receive it. Well, it seems like Peter did that. He, he grew, he grew from that. And matter of fact, it's a beautiful season of growth too. Cause even the Lord, Hey, look, I'm going to just show you this sheet. All right. I'll get you out of town. It's just with a tanner, and I'm going to make you see the sheet of what's clean, unclean, and then and, and Peter receives it. Can we receive rebuke and discipline and truth? A couple other things. He's still, this is a common thing for disciples. They're sent, so I've just got to keep praying. Who, who are you sending me to, Lord? Chat, Acts 8, 14, disciples are people who are sent. Disciples go. If Jesus is the sent son, the Father who sent him, it's just like the Father through the Spirit to send us. He sent the Son. He sent the Spirit. He is ascending God. Where is he sending you? And I, again, like I said, it's it's this picture of, I just addressed it. I was going to say again, I love that Peter's open to God working things out in him. I had a professor in seminary say I took a class on Acts. And you remember now, after Stephen, after the, they're, they're selected, I think it's Acts 6, um, off the top of my head. But when people say, hey, we'll serve widows, we'll do that. We'll roll up our sleeves and do that work. And, and it's right for, for uh, uh, the disciples to say, hey, we need to be praying and we need to be in the word. There's, that's right. We need to divide uh, the body of Christ tasks and duties. That's right. But the minute the disciples say, we're not rolling up our sleeves anymore to serve people, you don't hear about any of them. You hear about the death of James. We don't hear any significant ministry except for Peter. And my seminary professor said, it's probably because God's still got a lot to work out. In and, and so he's working some things out. You see it, though, in his response to the white sheet and, um, and elsewhere. Okay. Uh, the martyrdom I'm not going to talk a lot about because I really don't know. It's all extra biblical. You get that moment in John where it's predicted. Um, in John 21, we do know that he's been in prison. Uh, you can go to Acts 12, 5 and elsewhere. Uh, where the Lord is miraculously, by the way, it goes back to his boldness. Just anyway, that's another, I've already covered all that afterwards, just being defiant about that. Don't, don't talk anymore about Jesus and they do, but it's, it's, 
a lot of voices and historians have talked about Peter's martyrdom. It seems like he was crucified upside down. I don't know that that's factual, but it, it seems like you have a, a, enough reports uh, where that's happened. Uh, there's so much from his life to copy. I, I'm being very quick here because we've spent at least an hour and a half, two hours. We, we could talk a whole lot about what Jesus is, how he's revealed himself to Peter, um, what we can learn from Peter for, for things that we ought to do to allow our weaknesses to be used, to be able to take, um, not only to be able to take correction, but to take forgiveness well, but then to offer that forgiveness and grace uh, to others. So, and again, I'd be really interested to know what you're picking up or what you've learned uh, from this study on Peter. We'll be back next week to pick up just some final words about discipleship and just look a little bit at Paul. We wouldn't have time to do a, a whole study on Paul in, in just 30 minutes together, but at least just a couple of highlights of, of the ways in which he followed well and how he lived out some of these common traits uh, that we've been talking about. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for uh, these weeks together seeing all that you have done for Peter, seeing as well the things you, you did in and through him, how you redeemed him and restored him, his faithful response to your love and to your grace and to your power. We just pray for ourselves if there are things we need to see in response to this, your word about, about where we need to be sent, about how we need to use our influence, about how we need to offer our brokenness to you, how we need to be bold in speech, how we need to be filled and led by the spirit, whatever it is. Father, we pray that you would bless, um, bless our response, that we would, as Christ told Peter, that we would follow well. And again, Lord, that we would be restored well, reconciled well. Thank you for this time. Pray you would continue to bless our response to it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we have one more week uh, next week, so I hope that you'll be back for that. God bless you.